Luke chapter number 9. We'll begin reading in verse number 28. The Bible says, And it came to pass about in eight days after these things, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were awake, they saw his glory in the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias, not knowing what he said. While he thus spake, there came a cloud, and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone, and they kept it close, and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. And it came to pass that on the next day, while they were come down from the hill, much people met him. Now this passage, often referred to as the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus goes up into a mountain to pray, he takes the, if you want to call them, the inner circle of the disciples. Any time that Jesus went and did something and it was something special, who did he take with him? Peter, James, and John. Right, well, I mean, you go and study afterwards, who were arguably the three most influential for the Jews, the disciples after Jesus was raised from the dead and returned to glory, Peter, James, and John. Right, so, that, you know, God didn't love the other ones anybody. He knew they needed it. Right, well, they go up. Likewise, in, you know, the garden, Jesus goes up to pray three times, comes back, what happens each time? They're asleep. Right, well, what happened in this passage? Well, as he prayed, you know, it says his countenance was changed, his raiment was changed. Moses and Elias came. But, verse number 32, Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, well, that means that at some point they were asleep. So they slept through part of it, woke up and caught the tail end of it. As Jesus prayed, his visage, his countenance was changed. Now, I've heard people say that he was transformed into the image that he has in heaven. Well, I don't think so. Because the Bible says that no man can see God and live. So I don't think he looked like John saw him over in the book of Revelation. And even then, John could only give us a description of what he looked like based off of the words that we would understand. You know, skin was as brass. Well, I really don't think that Jesus' face looks like a doorknob. Right? Don't think it's the same color, but I think that's as close as he could get to describing what he really looked like. I don't think that white as wool or white as snow can really describe how pure his hair really is. But same thing here. They just got to see a little bit of who really Jesus was when they woke up. And in fact, a little bit of that holiness came out. It got all over his clothes. Take a look. It said, verse number 29, as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered. I mean, he still looked the same, but you could tell that he, something was different. His countenance was the same, but the fashion of his countenance was changed. What's that? Just got a little bit more holy. Right? Just a little bit of that I am that I am started to shine through. And then it says, and his raiment was white and glistening. That's why I don't think snow don't glisten. That wool doesn't glisten. This is something that, but what was it? Well, it was white and it was glistening, but can't really describe it. Right? The woman had said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, she was on to something. Because when God's around, whatever's touching God, whatever's close to God, it's got a little bit of God in it. How do you say that? Because when his visits was changed, his clothes changed too. Right, well, we keep going. 
Two men came to speak with him. Verse number 30, Behold, there talk with him two men, which were Moses and Elias. Now you got to watch which commentary you read, because some commentary will tell you that these guys came from heaven to talk to him. Not so. These fellows weren't in heaven yet. They were still in Abraham's bosom, paradise. But, where they were, paradise, that was their souls that traveled to Abraham's, but their bones were still around. In fact, Jesus criticized the Pharisees of his day for worshiping the bones of the prophets and parading them around. He said, well, where was Elias' bones? Well, his weren't anywhere because he got taken up in a chariot of fire. Good luck finding those. Same thing with Enoch. You know, he walked with God and then he was not because God took him. Right? And then there was Moses, the lawgiver. Funny, I, ironic. I don't know what the word is. Peter, people judge him. Heard preachers preach against a lot of things of Peter. Peter's a pretty sharp guy because Peter woke up not knowing anything and he knew who Moses and Elijah were. But Peter, when they were with him and held him asleep, and when they were awake, they saw his glory in the two men that stood with him. came to pass as they departed. Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be heirs. Let's make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. He pieced it together pretty quick. But see, Peter seeing just their soul, the thing that God preserved in Abraham's bosom, he thought they were worthy of worship. In other words, they not being turned into what God had for them because they're not going to get the body that God wants them to have until we get that body. They which are dead in Christ shall rise first, be caught up quickly changed. Right? And we which are alive and remain, going up too. They need that little bit of extra time for God to take what they used to have, turn it into what they need. What do you say? They saw what God saw. Man looketh on the outward appearance, God looketh upon the heart. Seeing their love and devotion for God, I don't think that Peter was so ignorant that he thought, well, we should worship Moses and Elias. He just saw, just saw a little bit of what Jesus was. And I'm convinced it didn't compare to what Moses and Elijah were. But what did he see? He saw their dedication to God, he saw what their stand for God really looked like he had heard stories he had heard the accounts same accounts that we have I mean when they got up and they read the Old Testament they read the same thing that we did only in Hebrew heard the exact same story but he said that those men because of their dedication because of their true love for God they deserve to be remembered respected I truly believe that he wasn't saying we need to bow down and worship Elijah and Moses. He knew better than that. Reading about Elijah and Moses, who'd they tell you to worship? God. That first commandment that Moses brought down, what'd they deal with? God's the only God. Don't worship anybody else but Him. Right? What was Elijah's deal? Most of his life was combating the wickedness of Baal and his prophets because it had gotten into high places adultery, the groves, the prophets of the grove, the prophets of Baal. What were they doing? They were worshiping everything else but God. Don't think that Peter said, well, I think we should worship those. He's saying, there's something about them guys that deserves to be remembered. Not knowing what he said, the Bible says, what's that mean? Their deeds are already recorded. What did Jesus in the story of the rich man and Lazarus say? that Abraham said to the rich man, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, they're not going to hear if one raises up from the dead. If people don't believe this part back here, they're not going to believe anymore because the tabernacle was made. And they didn't serve to get a tabernacle. They served because they loved God. They didn't do it for wood, hay, and stubble, which is what a tabernacle would be. It wouldn't last. Even those things which were made of old, that nowadays people go and take museum 
trips and they fly all over the world look at these old things what they don't tell you is is that they've had to remake them about four times because they keep falling over and they need to put new concrete on them just wood hay and stubble but what he said basically the same thing that the Old Testament said there were some that took a stand and God used them greatly I honestly believe that but Peter after that yeah, he didn't know what to say he just said something that is typical of young Peter a whole lot different than Peter we get in 1st and 2nd Peter but he, he just didn't know what to say he got case that he can't help us and he said Lord I just want to do something let's just start building well came to pass after they departed from him departed from him okay doesn't say that Jesus' visage has changed any yet Moses and Elias they just departed okay then verse number 34 while he thus spake talking about Peter there came a cloud and overshadowed them and they feared as they entered into the cloud where did this cloud come from it came from God that's all I know well what was the cloud well clouds are usually made out of clouds and what was its purpose? Well, we'll get to that here in a second. But as they saw it, they knew this wasn't a natural occurrence. The cloud came around Jesus. Well, how do you know that? Because at the end of the verse it says, as they entered into the cloud. The cloud came and was a barrier between Jesus and these three disciples. Came down on top of the mountain. They went up the mountain with Jesus, but... They were close enough to see him, but they weren't inside the cloud. Well, what did the cloud do? The cloud stopped them from seeing him. That's what the cloud does. Can't see through a cloud. Well, it says, And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone, and he kept it close and told no man in those days, any of those things which they had seen. So what happens in these last couple of verses? Well, Moses and Elijah, they go back to Abraham's bosom. Jesus, still there, same place that he was, cloud comes down. Or a cloud came up, or a cloud came over. Don't know where the cloud came from, just know there's a cloud there. And there's something about the cloud that causes these three disciples to start shaking in their boots. Brought fear over them reverence they realize this is unnatural but it's also something we don't understand this is beyond our comprehension okay, and depending on how tall the mountain is y'all ever been so high up a mountain that the clouds are actually below you maybe they were in one of them spots where they went so far up the mountain they left the clouds behind them now all of a sudden there's a cloud place it shouldn't be I don't know what's going on I wasn't there but I do know there was a cloud. And the sight of this cloud brought great fear upon them. And then as they entered into the cloud to get to where Jesus was, they heard a voice. It says, this is my beloved son. Hear him. Very similar to what we heard when heaven opened up and the Holy Ghost came down as a dove the day Jesus was baptized. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But here it is, hear him. Still his beloved son. But listen. Take note of what he's saying. Then, when the voice was passed, in other words, after they got through the cloud, they found Jesus alone. Again, symbolizing that the prophets were just point, pointing toward Jesus. Everything that Moses laid out, we can go over the book of Hebrews, that was our schoolmaster. Show us that we were not holy. Everything that Elijah did and Elisha and all the other prophets since then, what were they prophesying of? What were they looking forward to? The birth of Christ. And the perfect work that he would accomplish and then complete. 
The cloud said, this is my beloved, hear him. Moses and Elijah are of note. You can find them in the hall of faith. Right? They were men that had the same amount of faith that we had, but yet they used it in ways that most people don't. Because they just trusted God. And God used them to do great things. But all that they talked about, that'd be like getting... But Josh, it'd be like going to a movie, talking to a four-year-old on the way out that had just seen the movie that you saw. Hey, is it any good? Tell me about it. Right, they're going to leave some stuff out. There's some stuff that I bet they didn't comprehend. Some things that were too great for them. Some things that maybe they didn't have the maturity to really convey what was going on. But all you know is they were excited about it. Well, now the motion picture's here. I'd rather just pay attention to the motion picture. Moses and Elijah, they told what God told them to tell for that time. But now, here's the one that they told about. So, keep going. Voices passed. Jesus was found alone. They kept it close. Told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. Keep in mind, book of your Bible, Luke, I mean, we can go and read the beginning of Luke and we can go and read the beginning of the book of Acts both written by Luke the physician you'll find that God burdened his heart to become a historian because there were a lot of conflicting accounts of things that had happened from people so where did he go? to the source those that were there when it happened Matthew, Mark, Luke, John they weren't written the day after Jesus went up into glory they were written when those fellows were getting ready to head off the scene. And they wouldn't be able to give a verbal account because a lot of them martyred. God purposed in their heart, you saw it, you write down for generations to come. Luke's account, where do you hear this from? Luke, James, and John. I mean Peter, James, and John. Because it says that they kept it in their hearts. That they told no man in those days. Well, then who'd they tell? Well, at some day later, they eventually told this story. At some point later, they shared it with Luke. But at the time, they were so filled with awe and fear and just being flabbergasted that they didn't know what to say. Kind of brings back to memory the passage from the wedding at Cana where Mary pondered all these things in her heart. Mary, the mother of Christ. Didn't say anything. In fact, after that point, we don't find her ever saying anything ever again. She said, whatever he says, you do it. She knew that much. Everything that Jesus did in it, she never said anything. She just pondered it. The one time she did say something, and the last time she said something, do whatever he says. Like as a 12, he was dumbfounded in the greatest scholars. All throughout the child, he wasn't like any of the other children. He was concerned with his heavenly father's business. Kept all those things in her heart and pondered them. But when she did say, like Proverbs, a word fitly spoken, she boiled it down to this. Whatever he says, do it. Well, here's these three disciples. Don't know man of them. Then, next verse. Came to pass that on the next day, not talking weeks, not talking a month, very next day, it says when they were come down the hill, much people met him. See, Peter, James, and John were on the mountain when the cloud showed up. But there were other people that weren't on the mountain that saw that cloud. There's something different about that cloud. People that lived around this hill, this mountain, whatever you want to call it, they knew what clouds normally did, and that cloud wasn't normal. Especially if the voice of God comes out of the cloud, that sounds different. I mean, when Moses was on the mountain, the whole mountain shook. Right? Great lightnings and earthquakes. Revelation tells us that his voice is the sound of many rushing waters. What are you saying? 
Somebody heard something, looked up and said, what in the world's going on up there? And word got out. Real quick. Because the very next day, great multitude of people. What are you saying? These three, arguably the closest disciples to Jesus in his earthly ministry. Right? They knew a little bit about spirituality. They still hadn't gotten all of it. Right? Still not perfect. God's still working on them. But they knew a little bit. Peter knew enough to know who Moses and Elijah without even being identified. So what are you saying? Well, they should have known what was going on. But even people that weren't spiritual, they knew something was happening. May not have known why, may not have known how, may not have known the reason, but they said, let everybody know something's happening up here on the mountain. They could see the cloud, and that was enough reason for them to go and tell other people. Back, you come down. You keep reading. This is the account where the man with the son that was possessed with the demon. He said, Lord, this demon's trying to tear my boy apart. He's having fits. He's foaming at the mouth. Literally, the demon's trying to kill him. And the Lord cast out the demon. What he said, because somebody saw a cloud, that boy got help. But when they came down the mountain, Peter, James, and John, they didn't say nothing. They were quiet. All right, so now that we got all that out of the way, bear with me. This is one of them Jordan things that I think about, and so I got to get y'all to where I'm at. Okay. I know we got a revival meeting coming up. I know we've had a whole bunch of revival meetings. You know what generally tends to happen? We come just thinking it's going to be another meeting. But then what happens? then the countenance of the Lord gets changed a little bit. Then we see something we haven't seen before. Then we get, we get real excited. Just like Peter. Then what happens? Then the cloud comes in. People freak out. They don't know what to do, so they don't do anything. Then after the cloud goes away, there's still Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But see, at some point, his visage went back to what it was as they knew it. They weren't comfortable talking about that Jesus that was different. The one that blew their minds. The one that was standing there on a mountain. If they was paying attention to the conversation, they would have figured out that Moses and Elijah were there talking to Jesus about what he was going to do to fulfill their prophecies. Go back. I mean, let's just go back and read it. Okay, verse number thirty-one. Who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. You know what decease means? That means death. They're there saying, "It's always like you're telling me that that's how you're going to fulfill this." They didn't know how it was going to happen. They were just there talking with him about it. Jesus is telling them everything that you, you know, through a glass dimly saw he said this is how it's all going to happen they're paying attention then the conversations that they had later where Peter said not so Lord you're not going to die right? he'd have figured that out long before if he'd have paid attention to this conversation we're not going to be teaching about that but here they're seeing something they've never seen they're seeing a side of Jesus that they had never gotten before and I will remind you they didn't get after John got a completely different look at him when he was the king of kings and lords of lord and glory. But they never saw this side of Jesus ever again. Just let a little bit of his true self out. I know it wasn't everything because they'd be dead. So what are you saying? They got a glimpse of something that they had never seen before. And then because of the responsibility afterwards, it caused them not to do anything with it. The cloud came down, and what was the cloud's purpose? There was a charge. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Because of what they had just seen, they were charged to do something with what they had just seen. God doesn't just do something just to do it. 
He's always got a reason for it. And you see, they only heard the voice when, when they entered into the cloud. They were afraid long before they ever got the voice. It took faith and it took commitment to step out and say, we're going through that cloud to get to Jesus. So what are you saying, Brother Jordan? Well, revival, camp meeting, whatever kind of meeting we have around here. What generally happens? We get a glimpse of something we've never seen before. Right? He shows up and he does something that he's never done before. May never do again. And what happens? People get excited until what? Until the cloud comes down. God stirs things up, and then when God gets down to business, people, they get a little scared. They pull back. The cloud comes down, and not very many say, we're going through the cloud to get back to Jesus. The fear of the cloud. The unknowing of the cloud. The fact that this thing which wasn't here now is here. People don't like change. But what's God about? Change. He saved you. What did he do? He changed you into a new creature. All right, he changed everything about you. He's all about getting us more like him. But see, they had to leave some part of themselves, that hesitation. Maybe it was their tiredness. Maybe they weren't as committed as they should have been with the Lord. But they left that behind when they walked into the cloud. They had to leave part of themselves outside to get inside. And when they did, then they got the charge. A whole lot of people get excited that we got a good meeting, but they never find out what God wants them to do with it. Why? Because the cloud comes down and inside, I can't see through the cloud. I don't know what's on the other side of the cloud. I don't know what's going to happen when I go through the cloud. So I'm just going to stay outside the cloud. That's not what these three did. They went in. And what was their charge? Hear him. Because right, these three, after he was gone, were going to be the ones that were charged with relaying the things that he said. These three were going to have to be the ones that took up the cross and followed after him that would suffer great beatings great tribulation don't you think it was a comfort in those days to know that they heard the things that they were teaching from the very mouth of God hear him but there's also the affirmation of who he was this is my beloved son they got to hear God himself say that's God too because the Bible says it takes two or three witnesses for something to be established as fact. But Jesus said that he and his father were one, and the father said that this is his beloved son. That's two witnesses. God always did things the right way. But anyway, they get inside the cloud. Then what do they see? Same Jesus. Same Jesus they walked up the mountain with. Same Jesus they were getting ready to walk down the mountain with. At some point, he returned to the Jesus that the Bible says that he wasn't comely. Wasn't anything that stood out about him. He was as normal as normal could be. But yet they knew in the back of their mind because of what they'd seen, there's something more to this man. This may be the form that he's taken out, but we know who he is. We've just gotten a little bit of a glimpse. Well, what happened? Well, these were three of the guys that ended up turning the world upside down. Not because they did anything, but because they heard and they went and they told. But the next day, they didn't tell anybody. They came down the mountain. I can imagine people all around what in the world happened up there last night did y'all see that cloud up there came out of nowhere and the next thing we know it sounded like lightning and thunder and the earth was shaking happened real quick in fact it's probably only about 
six, seven words worth of shaking. Because it only lasts, this is my beloved son, hear him. Then whatever happened up there is gone. What happened up there? The three guys that knew didn't say anything. The three guys that could have answered, well, this is the beloved son of God. Listen to him. They were silent. Somebody else had to tell them that day. Maybe Jesus was the one that told them that day. Because Jesus being Jesus, whenever people had questions, he is apt to sit down and start teaching them. Somebody told that man, that young boy's father, as he came up, he started crying, Lord. Well, how did he find out he was Lord? Somebody told him. Called a master in verse number 38. Well, how did he know that he was the master? Somebody had told him. But it wasn't Peter, James, and John. The story that this guy had heard, it hadn't included that Jesus just shown forth a little bit of his glory. This guy's a whole lot more than anything you'll ever need. No, this man had only heard the story before that. So what are you saying? Revival meeting comes up. Okay, we see Jesus like we've never seen Jesus before. We get one of them services where you know, they were supposed to be preaching, but then the big preacher shows up. Next thing you know, who knows what happened? Because all I know is what happened on my pew, what happened on your pew is something completely different. Right, well, after that, you may step through the cloud, really get in, as Brother Sidney preached during camp meeting, right, get out in the deep water, right, way out there. Come on in, the water's fine. Well, what do you got to do? You got to walk through the cloud. And you get there, and you hear the charge. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Hear him, and then eventually, go tell him. Well, come down the mountain. Nobody got told anything. Isn't that just, well, I thought there'd be something more on the inside of the cloud. What are you talking about? God doesn't owe you anything. The fact that he'd even care enough to show up during the service, let alone to show out during the service, do for you something that you've been needing or craving in your life, spiritually, and then you take, all right, I'm all in, Lord, and then once you get in, you realize, well, all my problems aren't solved. He didn't promise to solve all your problems he just promised to be there with you during your problems they promised that greater was he that was in you than he that's in the world your problems aren't bigger than the one that's inside you so your problems can't destroy you unless you let them the point of going through the cloud wasn't so that they'd see something it's still Jesus Still the same one that they walked up the mountain with. Still the same one that transfigured there before them. Everything they needed, they already had. But when they walked through the cloud, that's when they heard the voice. Out of the cloud. When you get committed, that's when God gets serious about you doing something. There's a will for God in every single one of our lives. But until we commit... He's not going to reveal it. Until we're serious about doing business with the Lord, He's not going to be serious about allowing us to do something for Him. It's required among stewards that a man be found faithful. You've got to be committed before you can be used. But after they get through the cloud, they didn't tell anybody. Now, isn't it just like modern day Baptists? Have a great week of meeting. Have a great service on Sunday. Right? Something just like Brother Mike preached about on Wednesday night. One of them services that it's just one of them that you had to be there. Can't describe it. Well, what does raiment look like, John? Well, his white and his glisten. But what would he look like? Well, his visage was st still pretty much the same, but it changed. It was more. More how? I don't know. It was just more. 
You had to be there. It's the best I can do. But one of those moments in your life happened. And then we walk out and it's like it never happened. They told no one. And they kept it close, told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. Didn't even give them a hint. Didn't even say, boys, we saw something crazy up there and once we wrap our minds around it, then we'll tell you. No, they kept it close. So, with the Lord's help with the little time we got left, the question this morning is, what things are you keeping too close? What have you seen? What's the Lord done in your life that He's brought you through that that place where things were dark and you couldn't really see what was going on and when you got to the meat of it you found out everything was going on for Jesus' sake really let's be honest anything happens in your life if you're in the will of God it's that Jesus gets the glory for it it's not for me to be glorified it's not for me to live an easy life it's not for me to sit down on a bed of roses and enjoy the rest of my time here on earth no it's for the Lord Jesus to be glorified because that was the will of the Father. The only thing that He predestinated was that those that did come to Christ would be transformed into the visage of His Son. The image of Him. What's that mean? They don't see me, they see Him. That He be glorified. What they find out once they got through the cloud, everything they didn't understand, one, Jesus had all control over it, but two, on the other side they'd see that it was all for Jesus' sake when you walk through the cloud and it's when you realize it's not about me it's about him some people aren't okay with that some people want it all to be about them or they want it to be mostly about Jesus but they want a pat on the back the Bible talks about men pleasers and gainsayers those that are out to glorify themselves and let me tell you it's nothing good Especially when it comes to robbing Jesus of what He's due, which is all glory. All honor. But those things that He's done in your life, He's brought you through the cloud, and all on the other coming through the cloud, that means you get to see who is in control the whole time. Is Him. But how many times has He brought you through the cloud? He shows you, I was here the whole time. Only for you to go and tell nobody. Keep it close. Those things which you've seen that have helped you on your hardest days, when you see another Christian going through it, and you could share that, I've been in a situation like that. It may not have been the same thing, but I've been at a point where there was no hope, and then he showed up and I had all hope. Didn't make it any easier, didn't make it last any shorter, but I knew through it all that he was still in control but we tell no one we keep it close some people would call that hoarding in fact show me chapter and verse where we're supposed to take those things that God pours out and blesses us with and keep them for ourselves we are vessels of honor you know what that means they were brought out for special occasions to be used as a sign of glory and respect and the power that the one having the big shindig really had. You didn't store things in vessels. You put things in vessels of honor to be poured out for others to show how much the Master cared for you, that He put out the good plates. He got out the good serving dishes. Well, if we're to be vessels of honor, that means that the only time we get filled up is when we're supposed to be poured out. But he also studied it out. What he fills us up with, that's nothing you know, sustain, sustaining. Right? The grace of God today will not suffice for tomorrow. That's why he's still tomorrow just as gracious as he was today. The mercies of God today, He says He renews His promises to us every day because yesterday's promise isn't tomorrow's promise. It wasn't today's promise. 
God knows that what He gives today is for today. It's not meant to sustain you. It's meant to prove to you that God is God. It is Him fulfilling His Word because it's impossible for Him to tell a lie. But grace and mercy, blessings, those richest, choicest blessings, if we let them sit around, they'd go bad. They're meant to be used now. But those things that He put in you to make you into a vessel of honor, those are the things that sustain you. Too many people are worried about how filled they are. What they should be concerned with is what they're made out of. Because He promised to make you a new creature. You know, that means He changed what you were made of. You know what he, first ingredient He put into you? Him. You know what He promised the fruit of your life would be? The fruit of God. You know what He promised that your words would become? Words like His. What your walk would look like? His walk. You know how that happens? We just got to let God keep working on us. We've got to yield to the hand of the Master. But so many times He'll accomplish something in our life where He's making us more like Him but instead of going out and telling, we try to hoard that thing up inside of us. Well, no, He did that for me. Well, He did it for you so that you could go tell somebody else about it. If He didn't want you to tell somebody, He'd take you on the glory. These three disciples, soon to be apostles, they came down the mountain that day. Who'd they tell? Nobody. What they see, something that nobody else had ever seen before. What they hear, something that only these three fellas heard that day. If you weren't there, you missed it. And the Bible says they told no man in those days. Not just that day, many days. What are you saying? Until God started working on their heart and said, hey, tell them about that day. They didn't tell anybody. They hoarded it. Once people started hearing it, word started traveling. And I know God changed their heart, worked on them. But how do you know that? Because everybody that they met throughout the book of Acts, guess what they're doing? They're telling them about Jesus. They're going to people that they thought they'd never go to before just to tell them about Jesus. People that they thought didn't deserve to hear about Jesus. That's why God had to send Peter the visage of the golden fleece so that he'd go down there to a Gentile and sit down and eat whatever food the Gentile put in front of him just so he could tell them about Jesus. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? God doesn't do something, just do it. If He does something in your life, it's so that others can hear about it. Imagine all the things that God did that day that He's never done since. I don't know about you, I've never heard of an account where Elijah and Moses showed back up on a mountain one day talking to somebody. Never heard of an account where Jesus, being robed in flesh, just let a little bit of what was inside come out through the outside. How there was a cloud that came down and out of the cloud the voice of God was heard to say, this is my beloved son, hear him. Things that in eternity past and eternity future will never happen again. Well, you, real, you do realize that when we come to worship and every now and then, instead of you know, just receiving worship, God shows up and shows how much he appreciates our worship, and he starts doing something that nobody else. You do realize that things happen that day that will never happen again for all of eternity. Something got settled. Somebody gave something over. God repaired something that people thought weren't repairable. God restored one that had thrown everything away. All that is never going to happen again. Which means if you don't go tell it, they're never going to hear it. 
We're very good at keeping our hard times to ourselves. I mean, the Bible does say to esteem others better than yourself. I don't think my problems are worth you even hearing about because I know that you've got problems. Other people's problems are more important than my problems. I don't want to bring them up. Why? Because I'm here to talk about Him. I'm here to worship Him. So I don't bring up my problems, but when Jesus shows up and does something in one of my problems, the Bible doesn't say I'm supposed to keep that hidden. No, we're not supposed to take a light and hide it under a bushel. In fact, we're supposed to give to others, press down, shaking, and bubbling over. That means give them everything that God's given you. Hold nothing back. Why? Because He's promised that He'll sustain us. Not with what He's blessed us with, not with what He's done with us. He's promised to sustain us in who He is. You get through the cloud and you realize everything you need is in Him. You're willing to give it all away. You're willing to tell anyone. You're willing to go anywhere. You're willing to stay up as long as it needs, as you need to, for you to give somebody else everything that God's given to you. But some people, they realize that, and what do they do? They come down a mountain, they don't say anything. What good is that? If this story had never been told, Peter, James, and John never told it. God did all of it for naught. Because God does things so that people hear about them. God does things so that those things done in secret can be glorified openly. He rewards those things done in secret, not in secret, publicly. Why? So that He gets the glory for it. When we keep things close, we rob God of the glory that He deserves. When we keep things close, we may have the very thing that somebody else needs to hear that day. Not because God couldn't tell them, but because God chose you to go tell them. Then I wonder how many times because somebody kept something close, the Holy Ghost got quenched during the service. Or because somebody kept something close that God was dealing with that person that was lost, but because the service got killed deader than a doornail, that person walked out still on their way to hell. Keeping things close. You don't get to keep them things. In fact, you'll find out that they start rotting real quick. That they didn't sustain you because you still need Him today just like you did yesterday. What He did yesterday is not going to help you today. Man doesn't live on bread every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So if he gave it to you today, it's because he wants you to go tell somebody today. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.